once they had given you the go-ahead, you had to cast. Was to what that? extent were you involved in the casting process? Well, having a Pulaski and having Bob Wise, especially at that time, uh, made casting very easy. But the person that I most wanted was Robert Ryan. We lived in the same neighborhood. We saw each other. Our children were growing up together. He's nothing like the character he plays. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think he was most revered and most remembered for the kind of villains that he played. I can't remember Bob, at least in any, certainly not in a major motion picture, ever playing a character who was not a villain. He played John the Baptist in the greatest story ever told. <laughs> Another villain. scene in the picture that I was reminded of again tonight as I looked at it was when he sat in the bedroom right after the, the argument with Shelley Winters and uh, he was dialing the phone to get hold of Ed Begley who was the other character uh, playing the, 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 the policeman and it was the way in which he dialed the phone. Each number that he hit on the phone had a resolve for mayhem. And the way in which he did it, I think, added strongly to his, to his villainy. And for us to be on the screen together, I had a rather soft look. He had this hard look. I came to the situation uh, with a sense of naivete that uh, Bob wanted me to maintain, I, I could have gone into makeup and gone to other things to harden uh, the way I looked on the screen, but we agreed that it should be straight ahead. The more naive, the more vulnerable that I appeared to be, the more it would work. Well, vulnerable, but seething inside. Well, yes. Uh, seething, a uh, very angry character. But sometimes the two are not easy to make uh, the proper waltz when the tune is being played. But I worked very hard at it, and uh, I think we pulled it off. I'm forever grateful to Bob, because uh, while we were shooting that film in upstate New York, we ran into bad weather, and we had torrential rains for a number of days, running into a couple of weeks, which held up our budget and held up our time. And he and I went back into New York City uh, just to take a week and break, we saw a play. And coincidentally, the play was owned by, uh, the rights to the play was owned by United Artists. Uh, they called me and arranged for us to go and see the play and asked me if I would like to uh, consider a co-starring in the film with my old classmate, Marlon Brando. And uh, I thought that God uh, had smiled on me favorably when this opportunity knocked at the door. And then I went and saw the play and left the theater uh, somewhat dubious <laughs> that I would be able to play this part. And then when I talked to Marlon, who had been approached and already seen the play, we both agreed that uh, it would be an act of insanity if either one of us uh, agreed to play the part, we would destroy the essence of the play and what the story was intended to do. And the name of the play was West Side Story. <laughs> Your character and uh, Robert Ryan's character in the film do have a lot in common. Which is? <laughs> 
they both put people of another color in a category. Oh, from the point of view of the yes, script? of the script. Yes, we both we had a great deal in common. We were both racists. Uh, we both saw life through pris prisms of race. And what was ironic about that was the fact that there was not a sweeter, dearer, more humane, a more compassionate human being than Robert Ryan. His, he, he graduated from Dartmouth and uh, he did everything. He was a boxer. He came, he came from Chicago and uh, wanted very much to be an actor and did Shakespeare and all that. But when he got to Hollywood, he found that uh, the rough and tumble side of life was the way in which he was always being cast. And he developed a, a love for characters that had an edge. But in real life, uh, I introduced him to Dr. King, who was just beginning to appear on the social and political scene. And I had struck up a warm relationship with Dr. King and committed myself to work for what was his cause that became our cause, and pretty soon everyone's cause. And uh, one of the most giving human beings, both financially and verbally, to our cause was Robert Ryan, who did a lot of talking and stumping and fundraising in behalf of Dr. King and the movement. What I find interesting about the character you play, it's a fascinating character, and we didn't really see characters like that on the screen at that time, is he has a lot of self-possession. You know, yes. there's a coolness about him, a kind of modern quality. We hadn't seen black characters like that. Did you, and, and at the time, uh, black characters were so underrepresented in movies, there were so few opportunities. Were you aware of or conscious of choosing that part to say something larger than just that character? Absolutely. Uh, nothing about this film was by accident. I think getting all the actors and getting all the script writers and the people who came to the, came to the mission really represented their commitment to the time in which we lived that was manifest in what happened when they wrote and delivered the film. Prior to Sidney Poitier's presence on the screen. But he played a different kind of character than Johnny Ingram. Very different. Very different character. But the point that I'm making is that prior to his presence on the screen, and a young man by the name of, uh, I'll think of his name in a minute, uh, there were only three of us, the young men that I'm thinking of. Thinking of James Edwards? James Edwards, right on the head. James Edwards. He's uh, a wonderful actor. Wonderful, wonderful actor. actor. Very young, very handsome. And uh, we kind of got caught up in a new wave of expectation and new, a new spirit. We knew among ourselves, uh, both verbally declared and the way in which we lived out our lives, that if we had a chance to grab the brass ring, at no time would we grab a ring that was below our dignity and below the integrity of our history and below the, 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 the qualities of life that we know that we possessed and lived in reality, and that our mission was to make sure that that was seen in everything that we would do. Sidney was the first at bat because he did it in No Way Out with Richard Widmark, uh, a film all about race. Uh, Richard Widmark, a gangster, was dying. The police needed him to live because he was a, a witness to a, to a syndicate and to a crime. And uh, the doctor on duty when they brought him into the hospital was this black surgeon played by Sidney Poitier and Richard Winmark didn't want any black hands and he used the N word quite often. And Sidney had to, in the face of all of this, listen to this tirade of, and this venomous view from this man's mouth and uh, do all he could do to to uh, keep from killing him on the operating table. <laughs> but Sidney did it so beautifully. And then all of the films that Sidney did tended to lean towards the squeaky clean, lovely, next door neighbor, sweet guy, guess who's coming to dinner? 
And here comes Johnny Ingram, who's not Johnny those things. Yeah, say, forget that. There's another side to all of this. And, but the goals were the same. And uh, when I worked with Sidney uh, in Buck and the Preacher, uh, he, he still insisted on being the sweet, lovable <laughs> lollipop. But, but you'd gotten away from that. <laughs> yeah, I'd, long as it's gotten Got away from that. Was there any yeah. internal debate about the ending? Which is shocking, isn't it, when the, 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 the apocalyptic explosion, the end of the world? Do you think that's too blunt, it's over the top, it's too much? Or did you want it to be that strong we to wanted, get the point across? We wanted it to be that strong. First of all, it was the height of the Cold War. Nuclear weapons had become proliferated. They were all over the place. The Russians and the Soviets with their stockpile, America with its stockpile, France and England were not too long behind. Then came Israel, and all of a sudden there was always this persistent, consistent talk of nuclear confrontation. And uh, in the meantime, all of Africa and Asia were at the height of their own rebellion against colonialism and expecting to have fair play after all that the Second World War promised its peoples of color, uh, they would be, as a result of that war, the war to end racism, a war to end race superiority, it would be a war to, to ensure democracy forever. And all the peoples of color who participated in that war knew no such uh, re reward. And uh, in a world that was in this upheaval, and what was going on with the blacklist here in America, and the rebellion, and the upheavals in the labor movement. The whole globe was in turmoil. And the truth of the matter was is that we could not find logic, and you could not find men and women of substance to sit and have discourse and take us away from the brink of disaster. What would you awaken showed us. the disaster in the film. You showed the disaster. And then that, that wonderful close-up, stop, dead end. That's right. Which is all a lesson. All the symbolism. All, and and that, the, that's like the last shot of Citizen Kane, keep out. Yeah. So. Yeah. Had Bobby Wise on both. Yeah, well. Yeah. But uh, also it was the fact that there's one, the last line in the film is when the guy says, which is which? And the other character says, take your pick. In the final analysis, when all this is over, if it ends violently, who will be who, and who will remember, and who will be the losers? Everyone. And the film tried. And that rather modest attempt at that time yeah. was no small task. It was, it was no a, small task, but remember, this is a crime story. This is a heist film, through, which, through the brilliance of you and your collaborators, you've elevated to, I think, this timeless moral fable. Well, I saw Bob just before he passed away. I was filming him for a documentary that I've been working on. And uh, in the course of our discussion, with all that he had done, I asked him, of all the films you've made, and he was very honest, I said, which one gave you the biggest charge? And he says on screen, he says, Odds Against Tomorrow. He said, that was the true test of my time, and I'm glad we lived up to it. <laughs>